Hi, I'm Pat. And I'm Jack. Welcome to our walking tour of New York's capital city. Though Albany may be new to you, you'll be following footsteps laid down over 400 years ago. In fact, Albany is the oldest surviving European settlement from the original 13 colonies. They thought it might make a good place for a settlement, but they'd be astounded by how right they were. Albany is a great place to live, with a sense of community, heritage, and continuity, a delightful variety of seasonal weather and scenery, and an unusually stable economy. Albany is a center for education, arts, culture, history, and some truly historic architecture. But why just talk about it when we can show you? So if you're ready, let's go. Our tour begins at the Albany Heritage Area Visitor Center, where you can pick up a self-guided walking tour brochure that complements this audio tour and explore an exhibit that briefly highlights the city's history. Later on, take time to shop for Albany gift items and locally made products in the gift shop. But before we take our first step, take a step with us back in time. Use your imagination for a little time travel back to the year 1609. It was in this year that Henry Hudson, an English explorer working for the Dutch, set sail on his ship, the Half Moon. His destination, Asia. Where he ended up? Well, at least they both start with A. Hudson had been hired by the Dutch to find a shorter route from Europe to the silks and spices of Asia. While investigating the source of the Hudson and its potential as a route, he dropped anchor near what later developed into the city of Albany. Here, he was greeted by Native American Mohicans and learned about the abundant supply of beavers, whose fur was in great demand in Europe. Throughout its history, Albany's river location has been key, beginning with its importance as a fur trading settlement and later leading to its development as a center of industry, transportation, and ultimately, designation as the capital of New York State. The first stop on our tour is the Albany Heritage Area Visitor Center, located at Quackenbush Square, near the corner of Broadway and Clinton Avenue. Look for the glass door entranceway along the pedestrian walkway. The Visitor Center is comprised of two historic buildings. As you face the glass doors, the building to the right is the former Albany Pumping Station, built in the 1870s to increase water supply to an expanding city. Water was pumped from the Hudson River to this facility, where it was filtered and then pumped to Bleecker Reservoir, located a couple of miles to the west. The water pumping facility was in operation until 1932. One of the original chimney stacks, which helped convert water to steam, can still be seen inside the visitor center. The portion of the visitor center to your left and closest to Broadway, 25 Quackenbush, was built in 1852 as one of seven townhouses that lined Quackenbush Street. In 1895, all but one townhouse was demolished for an expansion of the pumping station. 25 Quackenbush was renovated into administrative offices for the Albany Water Department and a large brick stable was built at the rear of the building. In 1897, the offices and stable were combined into one building. In the 1980s, the historic district was renovated, a pedestrian walkway was created, and the area known as Quackenbush Square was created. The former townhouse became the home of the Albany Visitors Center. An expansion of the center was completed in 1991 to include a portion of the original pumping station. The other part of the pumping station is now occupied by a restaurant, appropriately named the Albany Pump Station. The restaurant serves lunch and dinner and brews its own award-winning beer. Adding visual interest, two massive overhead cranes are still in place in the restaurant and operational today. The cranes, completed in 1906 and 1909 and used for pump engine repair, are each able to lift 20 tons. This doesn't imply that the restaurant's meals are heavy. The unusual brick building located next to the Albany Visitors Center, facing Broadway, is known as the Quackenbush House, named for the family that occupied it for nearly 150 years. 
An earlier Quackenbush home, located southeast of the current structure, was uncovered during an archaeological excavation in 2001. And you know, Pat, that name all came from Peter Quackenbush, an avid brickmaker who was the first family member to arrive from Holland. Peter's son, also a brickmaker, was the first family member to own the Quackenbush house. It's the second oldest building of Dutch architecture in Albany today, dating roughly to 1736. The part closest to Broadway is the original section of Dutch architecture and may have been built from bricks molded from right under your feet. It was an ideal brick-making site with rich blue clay, plenty of trees for firewood and water from the Hudson River. At that time, the river reached to the edge of the Quackenbush property. You would have been standing close to the banks. Again, reflecting Albany's cross-cultural history, the rear of the building is federal-style architecture, dating to the late 18th century. The most famous family member to live in the house was Colonel Henrik Quackenbush. Colonel Quackenbush escorted English General Burgoyne to Albany as a military prisoner during the Revolutionary War after the British surrendered at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777, considered by many to be the turning point of the Revolution. Burgoyne stopped briefly at the Quackenbush house before being held at the home of General Philip Schuyler, which still stands in the south end of the city. The Quackenbushes not only built houses and hosted generals, but played another key role in the infant democracy. Following the war, Colonel Quackenbush loaned the newly formed and bankrupt United States government $60,000 in gold. Quackenbush descendants lived in the house until 1864 when it was sold to a banker. Subsequently, the house has been home to businesses including an antique store, a drug store, a furniture store, a tavern, and a handful of fine restaurants. We're now ready to walk to our next tour location. During the tour, we'll instruct you to head north, south, east, or west. As a frame of reference, standing in front of and facing the Quackenbush House, the Hudson River is located straight ahead. You can't see it from where you're standing, but the river is not far away, situated to the east of the city's downtown district. And because the city was built on a hill, the river is always downhill from any point. So let the river be your guide, much as explorers centuries ago. Now, from the visitor center, walk south just a few feet to the corner of Broadway and Clinton Avenue. Cross Broadway and walk up Clinton Avenue to the corner of North Pearl Street and Clinton Avenue. Cross North Pearl Street and stand in front of the Palace Theater. The Palace Theater opened in 1931 as one of the jewels of the RKO movie theater chain. It was a true palace of a theater, designed in ornate Austrian Baroque style by John Eberson, the world's foremost theater architect of the time. It opened in the middle of the Great Depression as a movie theater with a stage for presenting live vaudeville acts between feature films. It was the largest theater in the city at the time when Albany already had a number of opulent theaters and is the only one remaining. After surviving the advent of talkies, the palace became the city's premier movie house until after World War II. With the advent of TV, the rise of suburbia, and the abandonment of downtown, the palace struggled economically, closing its doors in 1969. The city of Albany later purchased the theater and reopened the venue for performing arts and cultural events and as a performing home for the renowned Albany Symphony Orchestra. In 2003, extensive renovations were completed and a new marquee replicating the original was installed. The Palace Theater is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Now Clinton Square sits across the street from the Palace Theater at the southwest corner of North Pearl Street and Clinton Avenue. Cross Clinton Avenue as soon as the traffic allows and stand in front of the row of buildings at Clinton Square. Clinton Square was named after Governor DeWitt Clinton, sponsor of the Erie Canal, as noted on the historic marker at this site. Clinton, who served both in the New York State Legislature and U.S. Senate, was mayor of New York City and governor of New York State. 
In 1812, he narrowly lost the race for President of the United States to James Madison. Clinton was a strong advocate for building a canal to connect the waters of Lake Erie in the west to the Hudson River. Opponents called his plan Clinton's Ditch, but when the Erie Canal opened in 1825, it was often referred to as the eighth wonder of the world and truly was an engineering marvel. The canal offered cheap and safe transport of goods and opened the country west of the Appalachian Mountains to settlers. The canal system was enlarged a number of times and today consists of the Erie Canal and three branches, the Champlain, the Oswego, and the Cayuga Seneca Canals. While we're here, take note of Three Clinton Square an 1832 structure of federal-style architecture to the far left of this row of buildings. Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick, lived here for a time in his youth. You'll find a historical marker about Herman Melville located around the corner on Orange Street. Now walk south to the corner of North Pearl and Orange Streets and cross Orange Street to stand in front of the first church in Albany. You know, Pat, Teddy Roosevelt prayed here. The first church in Albany, part of the Reformed Church in America, was established in 1642 and is the second oldest congregation in New York State. As the congregation grew, it moved to various locations in the city, including the intersection of present-day State Street and Broadway, where the best-known Blockhouse Church was built. The fourth and current building, designed by Philip Hooker, was built in 1798 and is designated as a National Historic Site. Several national figures have been members of the church, including, as I mentioned, Theodore Roosevelt, while governor of New York State. A plaque marks his pew. The hourglass pulpit inside the sanctuary is the oldest pulpit in the United States, imported from Holland in 1656. Also on display is the 1720 Charter of Incorporation, the weathercock from the previous Blockhouse Church, and various other artifacts. The Sarah Fay Sumner Memorial Window, located in the lobby, is the work of Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Visitors are often able to access the interior of the church just by ringing the doorbell at the south side entrance. Why don't you give it a try? It's well worth the visit. Okay, continue your walk now, heading south on North Pearl Street and stop in front of Capitol Repertory Theater, where North Pearl Street and Sheridan Avenue intersect. From food for the family to food for the soul. Formerly a supermarket, this mid-20th century structure was rehabilitated for the Capitol Repertory Theater, which brings professional theater to the community year-round. Program brochures and the box office are located just inside the front doors. Now, continue walking south, just beyond Columbia Street, to 74 North Pearl Street, to the site of the original Kenmore Hotel. The Kenmore Hotel is rich in Albany lore. Completed in 1878, it's an architectural statement of its era, with high Victorian Gothic elements, including red brick walls, a gable with geometric motifs, and iron balconies. The first proprietor was Adam Blake Jr., a wealthy African-American with a background in hotel management. That was highly unusual for the late 1800s. And prior to the Kenmore, Mr. Blake owned the glittering Congress Hotel, which was later demolished to make room for the state capitol. Though elegant, the Kenmore had its raffish side too. Its nightclub, the Rainbow Room, hosted big bands and was a favorite watering hole for the notorious gangster and bootlegger Legs Diamond, subject of the book Legs by Pulitzer Prize winning author and Albany native William Kennedy. The Kenmore was rehabilitated and converted to offices in the 1980s. To get a flavor of the Kenmore in its heyday, take a look at the black and white photos in the front windows. Now, continue south along North Pearl Street to Steuben Street, a cobblestone pedestrian walkway. The Steuben Street sign is across the street on the left-hand side, or east side of North Pearl Street. 
Another dramatic and historic structure stands at the north corner of Stuben Street, the Stuben Athletic Club, formerly the YMCA. Albany architects Fuller and Wheeler were nationally recognized for this type of building and also consulted on the construction of the YMCA in Paris, France. The building was completed shortly after the invention of basketball in Springfield, Massachusetts. And in fact, the Springfield team's first away game was played here. After years of vacancy and deterioration, the building was converted to a club and restaurant in 1982. As you begin your ascent up Stuben Street, notice the white line painted on the walkway. This line was painted in 1986 during Albany's tricentennial. 300 years earlier, in 1686, the Dongan Charter designated Albany as a city. The white lines you see around downtown mark the location of the protective stockade wall that once surrounded the city. If you stand facing west on the left side of the line, you'd be safely within the stockade. Note also the cobblestones that line the street. They were taken from ships that brought goods to Albany's port during the 19th century. The stones were used to even out the weight of ship cargoes and discarded once the cargo was unloaded. The stones were then used to create streets. Continue up Stuben Street and notice in the distance to the left a weather vane of the Angel Gabriel that stands at the top of St. Mary's Church. The statue is nearly 18 feet tall. Continue up Stuben until it ends at Lodge Street. St. Mary's Church is just to your left. The Romanesque revival structure you see today is the third St. Mary's Church, dedicated in 1869. The first St. Mary's Church was built in 1797, the same year that construction began on the present day First Church in Albany. When the St. Mary's Congregation was established in 1796, it became the second oldest Roman Catholic parish in New York State, superseded only by St. Peter's in Lower Manhattan. At the top of the bell tower is a weather vane of Angel Gabriel that Pat just mentioned, an unusual site for Catholic churches which traditionally bear a cross. Based on the doctrine of the Annunciation, it was Gabriel who announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. Inside the church, frescoes by Italian artists date from 1891 to 1895. Moving on now, at the corner of Lodge and Pine Streets, cross Pine Street and then cross Lodge Street to head west along Pine to the top of the hill. Albany City Hall is just to your left. That's right, Jack. This is where all levels of New York State government intersect city, county, and state. After fire destroyed the previous structure, the new Albany City Hall was designed by Henry Hobson Richardson and completed in 1883. It's built of granite and brownstone from Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Albany's famous Carillon was equipped in 1927 with 60 bells made by the John Taylor Company of England. It was the first municipal carillon in the United States. You can still hear it played at noon on some weekdays and during scheduled concerts. The statue located in front of City Hall is the likeness of General Philip Schuyler, whose mansion is in the south end of Albany. Schuyler was quartermaster general of the Northern Department of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Another noted work by sculptor George C. Hawley is the Fountain of Moses Smiting the Rock, located in Albany's Washington Park. Hey, you want to see what a half a billion dollars looks like? Walk up the hill from City Hall where Eagle, State Street, and Washington Avenue connect, and you'll see the magnificent New York State Capitol. Construction began in 1867 and was completed in 1899 at a staggering $25 million, or approximately a half billion dollars in today's money. Over the course of 30 years, the Capitol was designed by leading architects of the day, Thomas Fuller, Leopold Eidlitz, Henry Hobson Richardson, and Isaac Perry. 
The exterior beautifully illustrates the battle of styles among the architects, varying from Italian Renaissance to Romanesque to French Renaissance. One of the most prominent features of the interior is the Great Western Staircase, also known as the Million Dollar Staircase, designed by Henry Hobson Richardson. The staircase took 14 years to complete, features 444 steps, and reaches 119 feet high. And you guessed it, it cost a million dollars to build. But what really makes this staircase so extraordinary are not the steps, but the stone carvings sculpted into the walls. Of course, the carvings depict prominent figures such as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But once the prominent faces were completed, the stone carvers were allowed to sculpt faces of family, friends, even strangers. And as you study the faces, you can tell they really enjoyed their work. Other significant features of the Capitol include the Senate Chamber, considered one of Richardson's finest designs, the Assembly Chamber, the Executive Chamber, and the Flag Room. The Flag Room holds a collection of 1,000 flags representing New York State's commitment to the nation's war effort. Guided tours of the Capitol are available through the Empire State Plaza Visitor Center, located on the concourse level of the Empire State Plaza. Self-guided audio tours are also available. Walk north now along Eagle Street to the northeast corner of Eagle and Pine Streets. The Court of Appeals, New York State's highest court, was completed in 1842. Designed by Henry Rector, the architectural style is Greek Revival. The carved oak courtroom was designed by Henry Hobson Richardson and moved to this building from the New York State Capitol. Walk one block north to the Albany County Courthouse at the corner of Eagle and Columbia Streets. The courthouse, completed in 1916, is constructed of granite and limestone. Because it's built on a slope, there are four stories in the front of the building and six in the back. Talk about imposing? The classic doorways have massive bronze doors that seem to suggest the majesty of the law. The cast iron lamps are shaped like acanthus leaves. The court is constructed with Doric columns of cream-colored limestone from Caen, France, with ionic columns of variegated Belgian marble and a vaulted stained glass ceiling. At this time, you may continue this recording or you may begin your descent along State Street. If you're continuing, please cross Eagle Street and walk to the corner of Eagle and Elk Streets. If you're heading down State Street, proceed south to the corner of State and Eagle and turn left onto State. The park located at this site is Academy Park, named after Albany Academy, the school that originally occupied the building in the center of the park. Academy Park is situated on two acres to the east of the former Albany Academy, and Lafayette Park, which was developed a century after Academy Park, is located on the west side. Today, the building is officially known as the Joseph Henry Memorial. Built between 1814 and 1817, it's Albany's oldest civic building. When Albany Academy outgrew the space, the City of Albany purchased the building and renamed it after the Academy's best-known professor, Joseph Henry. While discovering magnetic induction at the Albany Academy, Professor Henry pioneered the telegraph, electrical motor, and telephone. Joseph Henry served as the first secretary or director of the Smithsonian Institute. The unit of inductance called the Henry immortalizes his name. The City School District of Albany now occupies the former academy. Across from the park on Elk Street are some of the finest Federal, Greek Revival, and Gothic Revival residences surviving in Albany. Many notables lived on Elk Street and three buildings served as governor residences before New York State purchased the executive mansion on Eagle Street. As you stroll west on Elk Street, of particular architectural interest are the following. At one Elk Street, located closest to Eagle Street, the New York State Bar Center is an innovative hybrid consisting of a modern structure at the rear of the building combined with five 19th century townhouses facing the street. This design won the 1968 Progressive Architecture Design Award as well as the American Institute of Architects 1972 Honor Award. The building was expanded and refurbished in 1990. 
Numbers 17 and 21 Elk Street are exceptional examples of Gothic Revival architecture. They were built in 1846 by prominent Albany builder David Orr, who by the late 1860s was one of the ten richest men in Albany. They were also two of a handful of houses in Albany built by Orr that were the most technologically progressive houses of the time, featuring central forced air heating, modern kitchens, and indoor plumbing. Orr and his business partner, Andrew Cunningham, also built the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, Albany's Roman Catholic Cathedral, located at the south end of the Empire State Plaza. What makes these houses so significant? Gothic Revival from the 1840s was designed as a rural architecture style. To apply Gothic details to typical brick row houses was indeed unique. More examples of Orr's Gothic Revival work can be seen just below the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception off Madison Avenue on Madison Place. Now continue walking west on Elk Street to the first intersection. There is no street sign here at this intersection, but turn left onto what is Hawk Street and then right onto Washington Avenue. Pause in front of the New York State Education Building. It's the one with all the pillars. This magnificent 1912 Beaux-Arts structure was originally designed to house the New York State Library, Museum, and the State Education Department. After the museum and library were moved to the Empire State Plaza in the 1970s, renovations were undertaken. The second floor contains a central rotunda, which rises to a leaded glass dome more than 90 feet above. This block-long structure with a colonnade of 36 giant pillars is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Just a couple of blocks west of the Education Building, you'll find the Albany Institute of History and Art. You may pause this tour to visit now or visit at a later time during your stay in Albany. Founded in 1791, the Albany Institute is one of the oldest museums in the United States. It's dedicated to collecting, preserving, interpreting, and promoting interest in the history, art, and culture of Albany and the Upper Hudson Valley. Exhibitions and education programs are open to the general public. Exhibitions include 18th and 19th century paintings and sculpture, ancient Egypt and the Albany Institute mummies, colonial Albany, the Hudson River School of Painters, and new rotating exhibits. The Institute is open Wednesday through Sunday. For a deeper sense of Albany culture, past and present, we highly recommend it. From the Education Building, walk west to the corner of Washington Avenue and Swan Street. Cross Washington Avenue and stand at the west end of West Capitol Park. This park is of Beaux-Arts design, as is its neighbor, the New York State Education Building. It was completed in 1930 and contains a tree-lined mall leading to the west entrance of the Capitol. A statue of George Washington stands on the west steps of the park, placed here in 1932, the bicentennial of Washington's birth. The building across Swan Street at the west end of the park is the Alfred E. Smith Building completed in 1930 of Art Deco design. When built, this 34-story granite and limestone structure was said to be the tallest building between New York City and Chicago. The building is named after Alfred Emanuel Smith, a four-term governor of New York State and the 1928 Democratic nominee for president. A frieze runs around the lower portion of the building, carved with the names of the 62 New York State counties. The lobby contains a mural depicting famous New Yorkers. The Smith Building brings a number of state agencies under one roof, connected to the Capitol by a tunnel. Continue your walk south to the corner of State Street and turn left onto State Street. Continue walking until standing between the Capitol and the Empire State Plaza. The Empire State Plaza was the vision of Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller, built between 1962 and 1978, and situated on what was once 40 city blocks. The plaza was designed by architect Wallace K. Harrison, whose other designs include the United Nations headquarters and the Lincoln Center in New York City, 
Often they consist of complexes grouped around water. The story told is that Rockefeller was embarrassed by the decay in Albany when hosting Princess Beatrix of Holland during her visit in 1959. Rockefeller was also very committed to bringing state government back to downtown after having been relocated to the Harriman State Office Complex on the west end of the city. That commitment resulted in the creation of the Empire State Plaza. The outdoor plaza is built over three levels of parking and a concourse of shops and cafeterias. The complex houses more than 10,000 employees in 10 buildings. The plaza is faced with Vermont pearl marble, varieties of Georgia marble, and Lenrock stone. The name Lenrock is actually the word Cornell spelled backward, indicating the stone was quarried near Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. All of the buildings at the plaza are faced with marble, except for the concrete spherical building affectionately referred to as the Egg. The Egg is a performing arts center, presenting local and nationally known artists. Although the Egg appears to sit on the plaza, it's actually rooted into the ground six stories below. The Corning Tower, a 42-story tower and the tallest on the plaza, is named for Albany's longtime mayor, Erastus Corning. On the 42nd floor is a public viewing area overlooking the Empire State Plaza, downtown Albany, the Hudson River, and Albany's surroundings. The plaza also offers a modern art collection, the New York State Museum, library and archives, a convention center, and more. The modern art collection has been referred to as the greatest collection of modern American art in any single public site that's not a museum. The Empire State Plaza has many memorial sites that recognize New York State citizens who dedicated their lives in service to others. Memorials are located throughout the plaza. The New York State Museum is open daily. The Plaza Visitor Center, located on the concourse level, offers guided tours of New York State's Capitol and the Empire State Plaza, as well as self-guided audio tours. Tours and admission to the New York State Museum are free of charge. Continue walking down State Street to East Capitol Park, located in front of the Capitol Building. The statue in East Capitol Park is a commemoration of Civil War hero General Philip H. Sheridan, who spent his childhood in Albany. The statue depicts General Sheridan in full military dress. There are 17 steps leading into the Capitol at the back of the building and 77 steps at the front, symbolizing the year 1777, when the first Constitution of New York State was adopted. From the front of the Capitol, now walk to the street light and crosswalk at the intersection of State Street, Eagle Street, and Washington Avenue. Cross the street and walk down State Street Hill. Your first stop along State Street is St. Peter's Church, located at the northwest corner of State and Lodge Streets. Construction on the present-day church was completed in 1860, but Anglican services were first held in Albany in 1708, primarily for British soldiers. The present-day church, completed in 1860, is the third in the history of the parish. It was designed by Richard Upjohn, renowned architect of Trinity and St. Thomas churches in New York City. Of particular note on the exterior of the bell tower are the three prominent gargoyles, each weighing three tons and extending eight feet beyond the wall of the tower. The church interior is decorated with works by leading artists of the day, including the rose window over the State Street entrance designed by the Tiffany Company. The growth of banking in Albany in the early 19th century was due to the city's progress in commerce and transportation, as well as the location of state government. Banks line both sides of State Street. Today, Albany is still an important regional financial center. Of particular note, as you continue your walk along State Street, are the following. 100 State was the location of the Albany Savings Institution. You'll find this building tucked between Lodge and Pearl Streets on the south side of the street. The structure was completed in 1902 and designed by Marcus Reynolds. The building was expanded in 1924 to include a tower. The exterior has stone ornamental detail. 
Inside, the vaulted ceiling is supported by marble Corinthian pillars. 90 State Street was completed in 1930 for National Savings Bank. The lobby has marble-faced walls, a coffered ceiling, and bronze doors. The banking room boasts two-story Corinthian pillars and a ceiling decorated with classical motifs. At the northwest corner of State and North Pearl Streets is a historic marker of interest located on the side of the hotel at this site. This corner was the birthplace of Philip Livingston, signer of the Declaration of Independence, born here in 1716. Around the corner from State Street at 11 North Pearl Street stands what was originally Home Savings Bank, completed in 1927. If you look up, you'll see reliefs of European soldiers and American Indians, for which the building is well known. 69 State Street was home to the New York State Bank, incorporated in 1803. The bank building was one of the most sophisticated in Albany at the time. The facade of the original 1803 building was incorporated into the design of the current building constructed in 1927. Inside the banking room are murals depicting events in Albany's history. This building is not only the oldest bank building in Albany, but the oldest in the United States continually used as a banking house. 63 State Street was designed for Mechanics and Farmers Bank and was completed in 1875. It is one of the best surviving commercial examples of Ruskinian Gothic style architecture. 60 State Street was built for National Commercial Bank between 1901 and 1903. The granite facade is designed in neoclassicism. The entrance originally had bronze doors. The extraordinary building at the northwest corner of State and Broadway was home to the Albany Trust Company and completed in 1904. Albany Trust commissioned architect Marcus T. Reynolds to design a new bank building on this site which had held a rounded cornered building since the 1830s. Since Reynolds cherished the history of his native city, he retained the curved front and added a dome tower above. The facade has Renaissance Revival detailing. Continuing the rounded motif inside, the main banking room is circular. Across the street at the southwest corner of State and Broadway is Hampton Plaza, originally the National Commercial Bank, completed in 1887. The architect was Robert Gibson, who began his career in Albany. Gibson was an admirer of Henry Hobson Richardson, architect of Albany's City Hall. Note the similarities in architectural style. The upper portion of the facade dates from 1906, when the building was converted into the Hampton Hotel. Of note in the interior of the building are a domed main banking room with mosaics, a leaded glass skylight, and a pedestal clock. Next door to Hampton Plaza is Jack's Oyster House. Jack's has been continuously operated by the Rosenstein family since 1913 and located at 42 State Street since 1937. Jack's is well known for its fine cuisine and top-notch service. The building was originally built for Stephen Van Rensselaer Gray, proprietor of a prominent book and stationery store. At the bottom of State Street, cross Broadway and bear to your right. Stand in front of the expansive building that serves as the administrative offices of the State University of New York. What were once the administrative offices of the Delaware and Hudson Railroad are now administrative offices occupied by the State University of New York. An Albany landmark, the Gothic-style building was constructed between 1914 and 1918. At the time, Albany was a busy river port, as well as a major railroad center connecting Boston and New York City through the Great Lakes region and onward further west. Six railroads serviced Albany, the most important being the New York Central and the Delaware and Hudson. The Albany Evening Journal built the adjoining building that stands to the south for its headquarters. Once again, the architect was Marcus T. Reynolds. His inspiration for the railroad and newspaper headquarters was the 13th century cloth hall in Ypres, Belgium. 
Details on the exteriors of the buildings are symbolic of the history of Albany and the printing process. The copper weather vane at the top of the central tower is a replica of the Half Moon, Henry Hudson's ship. To the south of the D&H building is the former ticket office for the Hudson River Day Line, one of America's most successful steamboat passenger lines that provided regular service between Albany and New York City. Also at this location was the Stadthaus, or State House, erected in 1741. The State House served as Albany's City Hall and as the first New York State Capitol from 1797 through 1809. Now, proceed north on Broadway. On the east side of Broadway, between State Street and Pine Street, is the James T. Foley U.S. Courthouse. The building opened in 1934 and originally served as a post office, courthouse, and customs house. Federal offices and the courthouse still occupy the space. The building is an excellent example of Art Deco design, which incorporates modern design with ornate decorative detail. The exterior walls are faced with Vermont marble. Eagles, standing eight feet tall, are carved above the two main entrances. They were produced from a 17-ton block of Vermont marble. Aluminum screens behind the eagles name the departments of government and contain motifs representing the departments of Navy, Agriculture, Labor, Army, Post Office, Commerce, and Revenue, as well as images of the courts, 13 stars representing the original colonies, and the New York State Seal. A frieze encircles the building. On the west facade is an image of Postal Service activity. The north shows customs activity, and the south illustrates the duty of the courts. The ornate interior uses six types of marble on the walls and floor. Marble mosaic medallions are inset on the north and south lobby floors, and a medallion of the United States seal is centered on the ceiling. Nine oil paintings adorn the main lobby ceiling depicting the seven continents, as well as the North Pole and the United States. Interspersed with the murals are plaster plaques of famous Americans, including George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Benjamin Franklin. The building is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Just north of the James T. Foley U.S. Courthouse, the Hudson River Way is a pedestrian walkway connecting Albany's historic downtown to the banks of the Hudson River. It begins on Broadway, where the Hudson River's edge once was, and continues to its current banks at Riverfront Park. An amphitheater, built for concerts and other public events, overlooks the river. One of the most significant features on the bridge is its illustration of Albany's history through a series of original Tromp Doyle style paintings. The paintings tell stories of ordinary people and moments in Albany's history beginning nearly 500 million years ago, when Albany was submerged beneath a prehistoric sea and continuing through the 21st century. Designing each painting required extensive research. Many paintings depict actual historical artifacts discovered in local archaeological excavations. A self-guided walking tour brochure of the Hudson River Way detailing each painting is available at the Albany Visitor Center. After crossing the bridge, if you have time, consider pausing this tour to stroll south along the river to the USS Slater. Of the 565 destroyer escorts produced in World War II, the USS Slater is the only one remaining afloat in the United States. It's also the only one with original battle armament and configuration. The Slater is open for tours seasonally, April through November. In the winter, it docks across the river at the port of Rensselaer. Now return to Broadway via the Hudson River Way. Continue your walk north on Broadway and look across the street for 524 Broadway, a very narrow building. Albany was an important link in the movement known as the Underground Railroad. This network of people resisted federal laws supporting slavery and helped escaped slaves to find their way to liberty. Two sisters, Lydia and Abigail Mott, were Quakers, abolition activists, and underground railroad operatives who lived at 37 Maiden Lane and operated a men's furnishing store right here 
at 524 Broadway. Now head north on Broadway to 575 Broadway, located across the street from Tricentennial Park. Union Station, located at 575 Broadway, originally served as a railroad station for the New York Central and Hudson River, Boston and Albany, and Delaware and Hudson Railroads. In particular, the New York Central and the Hudson River Railroads were among the most important American railroads of the 19th century. Centrally located in the most industrialized part of the country, providing a rapid route to the west. The station received 96 trains per day in 1900 and 121 per day during World War II. Reflecting the decline of train travel and rise of the automobile, the station closed in 1968 and sat abandoned for a number of years until it was rescued and renovated by North Star Bank Corps in the 1980s. It's now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Amtrak train station is now located across the river in Rensselaer. Now cross Broadway at Union Station to Tricentennial Park. From this park, you now have a clearer view of Union Station. Notice the New York State seal located at the top of the building. The female figures of liberty and justice stand upon a scroll proclaiming Excelsior, meaning ever upward. Tricentennial Park was dedicated in 1986 to mark the city's 300th anniversary. The statue at the center of the park is the Albany Seal of the City, which represents Albany's history of trade and commerce. The word assiduity at the center of the statue means diligence, which certainly characterizes the city's original colonists and reflects the development of Albany over the last 400 years. Tricentennial Park is also home to a memorial to former Albany Mayor Thomas M. Whalen III. You're invited to have a seat next to the mayor on his park bench to enjoy the view of Union Station. Now continue your walk along Broadway. Located at 600 Broadway, across from Tricentennial Park at Columbia Street, are the former offices of the United Traction Company, which operated Albany's streetcar system back in the day. The Beaux-Arts building was designed by Marcus T. Reynolds and built between 1899 and 1900. A little further along Broadway, just beyond the corner of Broadway and Van Tromp Street, note the Tromp Doyle style painting on the underpass. If only for a moment, this style of painting tricks the eye into believing what it sees is real. Were you fooled? To return to the visitor center, cross Clinton Avenue and then cross Broadway. Well, you've done it. We hope you've enjoyed your walking tour through historic Albany, New York as much as Pat and I have enjoyed being your guide. We encourage you to continue your stay in Albany by visiting some of our museums, enjoying a meal at one of our many award-winning restaurants, or just spending some time enjoying the outdoors and the scenery. The staff of the Visitor Center can give you tips and point you in the right direction. Enjoy your stay.